Good evening, and welcome to the 74th season of the Amos Fortune Forum. As many of you know, we normally gather at the Meeting House in Jaffrey Center on Friday evenings throughout the summer. This year, however, we're live streaming each lecture. We hope we'll all be together again next year for the Forum's 75th anniversary. My name is Brad Smith, and I'll be moderating this evening's presentation. Tonight, we're privileged to hear from Francie von Mertens, one of the Monadnock region's most beloved writers and naturalists, who will speak on wild bees, the pollinator pros, and how we can help them in backyards and beyond. Francie has written about nature for decades, including a column in the Monadnock Ledger transcript and scripts for NHPR Something Wild. She's an active land conservationist with the Harris Center in Hancock, with Audubon, and in her hometown of Peterborough. In the tradition of the Amos Fortune Forum, after her talk, Francie will answer your questions as we have time. You've joined this webcast either through Facebook Live or YouTube Live. You can submit your questions by placing them in the chat or the comments column which appears on the right of your screen. I'll monitor them throughout the presentation, so feel free to submit them at any time. And now it's my pleasure to hand things over to Francie von Mertens. Thank you, Brad. And uh, that was a very nice, I love being a beloved writer in the Monadnock region, thank you. I'm very pleased to, to be here little nervous, but presenting a topic that's 
increasingly in the news. The decline of pollinators, typically the focus is on honeybees. Monarch butterflies are often mentioned. My focus is wild bees. And I'm presenting quite a lot of information, so let's get going. This illustration here is a familiar New England apple orchard. There are seven bees, um, lots of visible pollen in the blossoms. They're called wild bees. Wild bees are considered to be those bees that were here before the European honeybee arrived. There's not a honeybee in this illustration. It's the cover of a guide to wild pollinators of eastern apple orchards and how to conserve them. The guide says that over 100 native wild bees pollinate New England apple orchards. This is the blue orchard bee loaded with apple pollen. It's not in the illustration either. Uh, she's collecting pollen to take back to her nest. It's the only food that her larvae will feed on. Somehow it was determined that 250 blue orchard bees can pollinate an acre of apples. A logical question possibly is how many honeybees would it take to pollinate one acre of apples? It's a task needing one and a half to two honeybee hives. That's thousands of honeybees. It's hard to believe and we'll be exploring how that's possible. Why the focus on pollinators? Most plants require pollination by animals to reproduce. Quickly, I add an asterisk. Mostly native bees. Others, mostly trees and grasses, are wind pollinated. It's a very inefficient system. Uh, trees release clouds of pollen with hopes that some grains will reach female receptors. Um, allergies are caused when they reach our eyes and nose in, instead. Humans typically are the main focus of the pollinator decline. I suspect most have heard that one third of what we eat and drink we have to thank pollinators for. Pollination services for crops are valued in the billions. I think we're learning to consider a broader context, the living, functioning, natural landscape well beyond the supermarket, and we'll be talking about that. Why the focus on pollinators? They're in serious decline. Something to get out of the way pretty quick. Native bees and most wasps don't sting. Um, if I do research on bees, the first things to show up on the internet are exterminators, um, pest control outfits, and that's where these illustrations came from. Wasps on one side, bees on the other. Bees are hairy. That has one of the reasons why they're great pollinators. So most wasps and bees are solitary. They're not communal. They don't have a hive. They don't have a big nest. Um, if you're near a hive or a communal nest, beware. The colony's queen, eggs, larvae, and stored food inside will be defended aggressively and understandably. But um, again, most native bees and wasps are solitary, and we will learn about them. Evolution is pretty cool. The first bees appeared soon after the first flowers some 125 million years ago. And the bees split off from carnivorous wasps. So all bees today share one wasp ancestor in common. Uh, bees and wasps still have a lot of common traits. Pollen and nectar, which is protein, pollen, nectar, carbohydrates, sustains vegetarian bees. Flowers in 125 million years have diversified to entice pollinators with nectar, pollen, scent, shape, and color. 
and in turn, bees have kept up, they've diversified too, all the better to access their favored plants. Pollinators and plant sex, um, no pollinators, no reproduction, no offspring. So at one stage in our lives, we all saw this. Anther, a bunch of anthers, male, stigma, female. Pollen grains, considered sperm from male anthers, reach sticky female stigma, fertilizing eggs in a plant's ovary. And there's an illustration of an ovary there. To the right, there's a red um, stigma at the top with pollen grains on it, pollen tube, the sperm cells go down into the ovary, they fertilize the eggs, seeds form, reproduction, and the next generation. Cross-pollination from one plant to another of the same species helps maintain genetic diversity and produce more viable offspring. So an important distinction, a plant pollinator versus a plant visitor. When you read about pollinators, um, usually butterflies, hummingbirds, moths, wasps, bats, bugs, beetles, flies are mentioned as pollinators. And um, they're only after nectar. They're not after pollen. They don't get in up close and intimate with the flower. Here's a, a butterfly with a long proboscis, uh, keeping her distance. She does have a lot of pollen on her wings, so it's very possible that some of the pollen's gonna hit the target in the flower. But they're plant visitors mostly. With notable exceptions, here's one. It's a chocolate midge. It's a hairy little noceum. Noceums are, are well named, very small. It is the one and only pollinator of um, cacao trees. Just thought that was interesting to add. So there are uh, notable exceptions. So lots of butterfly gardens, lots of pollinator friendly gardens. Um, this pollinator friendly design has a honeybee on it. We've moved, uh, we built a house. Um, we have a blank slate here to build the first thing. We don't have a lawn, but we have pollinator gardens. Um, and going through the process, I realized that it might be helpful to go beyond the confines of a garden and think of pollinator landscaping. And uh, I didn't realize that, but that's what we're up to now. And whether it's a in the confines of a garden or broader landscaping with shrubs and trees. Um, if it's for charismatic butterflies, honeybees, wild bees definitely benefit too, as well as hummingbirds, moths, wasps, bats, bugs, beetles, flies, which all of which have an important role in um, natural diversity. But here we go. Top pollinators are the bees. I love this photo. It's widely, um, it's in the all over the internet and the photographer, there's no credit to the photographer. Most of the photographs in this presentation are mine, unless they have a credit on them. There's a couple I lifted from the internet that like this have, um, uh, they're anonymous. Hal Borland, those of us of a certain age might remember his essays in the New York Times. Um, it was a final editorial on the Sunday editorial page. He would have a wonderful nature brief essay. And this is uh, one of my favorite quotes. Um, Cider and apple jelly will be ours because a bumblebee found a crocus in bloom in April. Uh, Hal Borland knew his nature. Uh, he knew it was a queen bee recently um, emerged from hibernation. Her energy levels uh, need definitely need uh, restoring. She's on the prowl for pollen um, and nectar. There's not a lot of pollen in early spring. The crocus is um, one source. Uh, in honor of how Borland, we planted purple crocuses and and um, uh, queen bees. We planted purple crocuses here. I mentioned that flowers um, have all sorts of shapes intended to entice pollinators. Um, they're pollinators and some of them have uh, directional guides to where the food is and this crocus um, has those guides. 
Why are bees such good pollinators? I love this photo. Um, they're hairy with branch, the hairs are branched um, to catch pollen. They're also electrostatically charged. The hairs are positively charged. Pollen is negatively charged and they come together electrostatically assisted. Pollen baskets, so-called, on hind legs or under abdomen carry a lot of pollen, which means there's less time commuting and more time pollinating. Um, bees have six legs and a lot of them are busy combing pollen into the pollen baskets. This is a picture of our common Eastern bumblebee. That's its name and it's very common. It's in fact about the only bumblebee you'll see out there. Bombus impatiens is its scientific name. Very important, flower constancy. Bees generally focus on one plant species at a time. They move from, this is a lupin uh, out north of Conval. Um, th this uh, bumblebee moved from lupin to lupin. It's very efficient. Goldenrod pollen, it also uh, increases the chances of pollinating. Um, goldenrod pollen gets delivered to goldenrod, clover to clover, goldenrod pollen does no good to clover. In fact, it might jam up the works a bit. The result, clover honey. So the European honeybee and native bees. European settlers arrived about 400 years ago with domesticated bees and beekeeping skills. The honeybee, so essential to early colonial life, it's a pollination generalist. It pollinates many crop varieties. Hives are movable, crop to crop with the seasons, produces wax for candles and honey. Native bees, some 4,000 species in North America, got the pollinating job done before the European honeybee arrived. And this is another important distinction that I'm, I'm seeing um, more and more. Honeybees have a very important agricultural role and little to no ecological role, which is means maintaining, maintaining natural systems. We'll talk about that a little bit, but that would be a slide presentation in and of itself. New Hampshire's home to some 200 native bee species. Most are solitary. Um, other than the social, very social honeybee uh, with a very complex um, communal system. And bumblebees are considered somewhat social. So all the rest are solitary. One female produces one brood alone. She lays eggs in brood cells that she provisions with the pollen ball that the larvae feed on. The adults live a month or so, and they emerge when their favorite plants bloom. Example, blueberry specialists emerge when blueberries flower. So here's an illustration. Most solitary bees are ground nesters. And here's um, strategies for three different species. And you can see the cells, the brood cells, and they've been, oh, first of all, the female um, uh, excavates the tunnels and the branch branches off to individual, or there's a couple group brood cells here. And she um, makes a pollen ball, lays an egg on it, and then she departs. And before she departs, she waterproofs the cell with a um, glandular <laughs> secretion. Um, which is brilliant. I've often wondered with all this flooding and rain and uh, runoff, and uh, but their cells are waterproof. And she also um, closes the opening uh, further help with um, to waterproof. So um, she lays the pollen ball, puts a, makes a pollen ball, lays an egg on it, and the egg hatches into larvae which feed on the pollen balls and you can see that some larvae are big and the pollen balls are small so they've uh, eaten most of them. The remaining solitary bees um, look for uh, 
um, tunnels, I guess. Uh, uh, well, here's a leaf cutter bee that's found a pithy stem. Uh, I guess you'd call them cavity nesters. Uh, so there's a pithy stem. She cuts a perfectly round leaf, uh, and that's how she separates her brood cells with leaves. That's why she's called a leaf cutter. Uh, the species, the group, are leaf cutter bees. Uh, mason bees um, separate their cells with mud and grit. As for the beetle, um, beetles drill cavities or tunnels that uh, that uh, these bees will also nest in. And so here's a um, someone who's added uh, nesting habitat to their pollinator landscaping. And it looks like there's some small beetle tunnels. Um, and it looks like um, someone with an electric drill uh, made some bigger ones. Lack of nesting habitat can be a limiting factor in certain um, settings. Uh, something we can keep in mind if as we tend our yards. Bumblebees and buzz pollination. It's a skill unique to bumblebees and a few other <clears throat> wild bees. Grabbing onto a flower, they disengage their wings and engage their flight muscles. They vibrate pollen loose with an audible buzz. You can really hear them when they're buzz pollinating. Uh, so it's a really, uh, it's a great term. With this skill, they can pollinate flowers whose pollen is hard to access. Cranberries, there's cranberries to the right there. Blueberries, peppers, including tomatoes. Tomatoes don't offer nectar. They don't make nectar. They only make pollen. So they're not of interest to a lot of pollinators. The pollen's also hard, difficult to access, and um, buzz pollination is uh, the best, uh, most efficient. Uh, if you have tomatoes in your garden, hang out a bit, and chances are you'll see a common eastern bumblebee um, buzz pollinate the blossom. This was in our backyard also. I thought we'd take a look at the annual cycle of a semi-social bumblebee because they're the most visible ones out there. So at the top, number one, there's the hibernating queen. She emerges. She goes to find purple crocuses. Uh, willow is a wonderful source of pollen, uh, pussy willows. Uh, she restores her um, fat uh, level, and uh, then she gets to work collecting pollen, making pollen balls and honey pots. She lays eggs. She'll keep them warm for a bit. The eggs hatch into larvae, and um, her first uh, brood, broods, many broods, uh, she'll produce up to 50 um, in a typical bumblebee nest. She's busy. Um, she worker bees are what she's producing and there at the bottom summer worker bees get working They're a lot smaller than the queen. You can see them. Those are full-grown worker bees uh, And the queen will stay in the nest uh, laying eggs and um, they'll deliver pollen for the pollen balls In the fall she dies her job is done um, Oh Wait, she's done something first. First, she has to um, fertilize some eggs, which become um, fertile queens. And she lays eggs that she doesn't fertilize, and they become males, drones. Uh, and then she dies. Um, and the female and the new queens or potential queens and the males leave the nest, and they go searching for a mate. Uh, and there, uh, there's a male and a female on a um, pinky purpley blossom mating, and she is now a new queen. She's uh, been fertilized, and she flies around looking for a mouse burrow or something which to spend the winter, and all the drones and worker bees are dead by now. So that's the cycle. 
Um, there's an expression, aren't you the queen bee? Well, queen bees are very busy um, tending, managing a hive. Um, a uh, colony of up to 50 bees is not easy. Here's a story about a bumblebee. I was uh, with a bunch of birders on a New Hampshire Audubon field trip to Coas County. And we came upon this bumblebee on gentians. Gentian blue, wonderful late season wild flower. And we watched her as she went from flower to flower. She's just emerged from one. She's heading for another. She pries the petals open, works her way down inside the petal. She disappears um, or almost disappears. Lots of buzzing going on. And then she backs out and moves on to another um, gentian flower. And she worked that, uh, they, it was like a colony of gentians, that's how they grow. And she was um, showing great flower constancy. When you're out observing nature like this, questions arise. I love the questions. I love researching the answers. So here's a logical question. Why do some plants make extracting pollen so difficult that only bumblebees can pollinate them? So, hmm, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with visitors versus pollinators. To avoid non-pollinating visitors, producing pollen requires a lot of energy. Some plants make sure that only certain native bees will get their pollen. Visitors basically are taking and not giving back. They're taking, they're robbing um, nectar. Most visitors are after nectar. So they're taking nectar and they're not giving anything back. Plants and their pollinators are nature's prime example of mutualism, where there's great benefit to both. In fact, one can't live without the other. So I've got colors here in boldface. That means this is important. Coevolution. Native plants in their primary pollinators, this gentian and this bumblebee, have co-evolved over millennia, always working on their relationship. And here is uh, probably one of the biggest specialists. Um, squash bee species, some pollinators like squash bee species really specialize. So here's a squash bee in a squash blossom. The adult stage coincides with when squash species cucurbits, the cucurbit family bloom, gourds, cukes, melons. They active soon after sunrise when flowers are fresh and pollen and nectar is uh, re restored. Honeybees are not active that early. They have long tongues. Look at, look at her tongue. I mean, that's impressive. Long tongues access nectar. Honeybees have short tongues. Their ground nests are near host plants, so they don't have long commutes. Now, here's a photo. It's taken at nighttime. So what's going on at nighttime? These are three male squash bees. Their only job, a male's uh, job is one and only, it's to mate with a female or females. So where's the most logical place to hang out? Um, if you wanna meet females, it's within a squash flower where the females early the next morning are gonna show up. <clears throat> so this is a question that you might know the answer to or figure out the answer to, where do they mate? Within the squash blossom. Finally, squash pollen is the only food that squash bee larvae feed on. So that is a very special relationship. <clears throat> Honeybees versus, or not versus, it's, well, they're not in competition, but honeybees and, and native bees as pollinators. Honeybees, they focus on collecting nectar more than pollen. Nectar is the base of their winter um, food in the hive. Um, humans take a lot of 
their honey, but they produce a lot more. Um, they can spare. So they're tidy feeders. You can see pollen grains on this honeybee here and there, a sprinkling. They travel up to two miles, or actually over, they will travel over two miles from their hive to forage. They have short tongues, I mentioned that. They remain in hive in wet, cold weather because they have food reserves. Uh, wild bees don't have food reserves. They're out in rain, they're out in early spring when honey, before honeybees get active. So here's our native bee. They focus on collecting pollen more than nectar. It's the only food their larvae feed on. There's kind of messy, um, a little hairier. Um, so if you're going flower to flower and you're kind of messy, there's a better chance that that pollen is um, going to be delivered to or find a, a, the female part of a flower, the stigma. So messy native bees are, that's another reason they're better, they're superb pollinators. A diversity of, na of native bee species, remember there's over 200 in New Hampshire, means there's a diversity of tongue lengths. And that's important. The flowers have diversified for uh, 125 million years. And some have shallow blossoms, some have um, deeper blossoms, and some are quite tubular. So the diversity of tongue lengths really helps a diversity of plants to reproduce. Also lacking stored food, they're active earlier and later in the day. Maine, um, blueberries are a big uh, money crop. Oregon cherries are a big money crop. So they really, 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 these states really study um, bees. And um, in Maine, a study determined that bumblebees visit twice as many flowers a minute than honeybees visit. And an Oregon cherry study determined that bumblebees are active twice as many hours a day. So if you do the math there, it's uh, a multi there's quite a multiplier there. I want to say a word here. Um, I wrote it down because I want to get it right. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. A honeybee. It's on goldenrod, a favorite wildflower. I celebrate when I see a honeybee. Here are some at the Harris Center's Pollinator Garden. I know beekeepers, I know their love for their bees and their heartache when they lose a hive. Here's a gift from one of them. And it's right next to me on my desk here and it's leaning up on a pair of binoculars of my mother's that date back probably 70 to 80 years. I'm eager for people to know about native wild bees and I'm eager for them to feel the same heartache at their plight and do something about it. Um, doing this slide, which was actually this morning because I realized it sounded like I was really bashing um, honeybees and I wanted to make a statement that I love honeybees. I celebrate seeing them. I don't see them often and I'm pleased when I do. So I, doing this slide, I realized this is not two honeybees, but there's a honeybee on the left and there's a tricolored bumblebee on the right. It's our second most common bumblebee, um, but uh, it's not seen very often. Um, we go visit family in Maine, and I see it up there a lot more often, but moving along. Here's a non-bee example of plant pollinator co-evolved, very familiar bird. It's our one and only hummingbird, ruby-throated. It's in a cardinal flower and see what's going on with the forehead. Just notice what's going on there. The plant is touching the hummingbird forehead. So here's what's going on. Um, some flowers have, some plants have male and female flowers. Up top in this um, illustration is kind of a fuzzy um, anther, um, hairy fuzzy. It's a great um, deliverer of pollen. And then down below is kind of a more, definitely more, compact. Um, it's a female flower, and I always say it's the sticky stigma. That's how I remember 
uh, stigma, and they actually are sticky. Cardinal flowers, they're red. Um, hummingbirds seem to be attracted to red. Tubular shape, perfect for a long bill. Hummer's forehead touches the anther on a male flower and receives pollen. Female flower sticky stigma is positioned to collect that pollen. Uh, cardinal flowers bloom when hummingbirds double their weight for migration. Soon, August uh, into September, um, hummingbirds, they're done with uh, their breeding season is over and their job um, becomes to actually feed um, very energetically to double weight before uh, they take off for a long, a long leg in their journey. Cardinal flowers and ruby-throated hummingbirds have a similar range. Question, and this question relates to a lot of pollinators and their plants. What if with climate warming, cardinal flowers bloom and fade earlier than ruby-throated hummingbirds fuel up for migration? It's, um, uh, it's a question that people are asking uh, a lot. More non-bees. We all know that monarch butterflies need milkweed for their species survival. There's a caterpillar eating, munching away on milkweed, um, but there's others too. Fritillary butterflies, are. we see a fair number of them. Um, there's a number of fritillary butterfly species. Um, their caterpillars eat only violet leaves. And so that's where the females lay their eggs, um, near violets. There's lots of wild violets um, in the natural world. That's my granddaughter Hayden with her colorful boots. Um, this plant some people will recognize as stinging nettles. Milbert's tortoiseshell larval host plant, it's the only place um, it's, uh, that's where they lay their eggs because the hatching caterpillars um, eat uh, mostly uh, stinging nettle leaves. There are so many plant and insect relationships we do not know about, but we're learning. So a different color slide, gray. Um, we're going to dip into some of the bad news. Insect apocalypse, we started hearing about that, oh, I don't know, five, eight years ago. Um, it's a term that was picked up many places. New York Times Magazine, it was the lead story. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? National Geographic dedicated a, um, an issue primarily to um, insect apocalypse. This was an article. And reading it, bees, butterflies, and other insects are under attack by the very plants they feed on as U.S. agriculture continues to use chemicals known to kill. Studies increasingly support what entomologists have called the windshield phenomenon. Fewer squished bugs on car windshields. And I think heads might be nodding out there um, in agreement. I would also say that there's a, a headlight phenomenon. Um, uh, moths uh, driving at night, not many moths uh, are in our headlights. For bees, most historic data to make comparisons with is for bumblebees. They're visible, they're big. Most are in decline. A few are locally extinct. Uh, the term for that is extirpated in most of their historic range. However, New Hampshire's most common butterfly, bumble, <laughs> bumblebee today is increasing, and that's the um, common eastern bumblebee. Why is, um, I haven't researched that, I will. It's diversity we've lost, that's what's important. I went out today uh, when the sun was on the pollinator garden and I counted um, bu uh, bumblebees and there it was easy to find 25 um, and they were all the um, bombus impatiens, the common one. Um, coincidentally, I went over next door to our daughter's um, raspberry patch and 
I uncountable numbers of this bumblebee. They were everywhere, um, over a hundred easily. I mean, uh, well over a hundred. So you might say, see that and say, whoa, this is so great. We've got so many uh, pollinators, um, but it's what's important is it's the diversity we've lost. Um, some of our bumblebees haven't been seen since the 1990s. A New York Times editorial used insect Armageddon. That was another term that came up and concluded one thing is already clear, the fate of the world's insects is inseparable from our own. A couple photos here that say so much. And here's our iconic New Hampshire orchard. Um, I'm sure I don't know how far back there were iconic almond orchards in California. Um, there's a region in China known for its fruit trees and they pollinate by hand. And the explanation is that pesticides killed the pollinators. All states have a wildlife action plan. Uh, it's um, it's a, uh, a study of uh, species at risk or of concern. Um, they're very impressive. Um, lots of um, naturalists work on them. So, and they've identified four bumblebees as um, species of highest concern. Reasons why changing agricultural practices that create large monocultures, use herbicides to kill weeds, decrease natural edge habitat and undisturbed ground for bee nests use pesticides that, quote, directly kill or cause impairment in bees. Transport honeybees and bumblebees for crop pollination, increasing general stress and pathogen spillover to native bees. Now we all know that honeybees are transported um, at great stress. Um, they'll go to uh, almond orchards in California for and feed on one food type, uh, and then they'll be shipped to I don't know, plums in Washington state or cher uh, cherries in Oregon, I don't know, but they'll be hopped around, they'll go south for who knows what. Um, also our most common bumblebee, Bombus impatiens out there in the raspberry patch over a hundred, um, because it does buzz pollination for tomatoes, greenhouse tomatoes are a huge industry. And so somehow Bombus and Patients are raised commercially and they're shipped to California, they're shipped to Europe. Um, they picked up a virus and they escaped the greenhouse and it spreads to wild bees. Um, managed bees no longer are wild. Um, pathogen. Um, Pathogen spillover is um, is the term, and uh, honeybees are up against a number of pathogens. Climate warming, bloom times no longer in sync with main pollinators' emergence, drought withered plants. So there's our blue orchard bee. Uh, what happens if the apple acre of apples that 250 can uh, pollinate? What happens if they? Um, it's a warm spring and they flower and fade uh, before the blue orchard bee emerges. Habitat loss, both for foraging and bare untilled soil for nesting. Pesticides, especially systemic neonics in agriculture, greenhouse and backyards. That's my emphasis in backyard. We'll talk about that. So back to out of the gray. Good news, attention is being paid at last. Obama, um, issued an amazing directive. Um, the Xerxes Society helped, worked with the White House to um, craft this directive. It was called the National Strategy to Promote the Health of Honeybees and Other Pollinators. There's honeybees mentioned. It was a directive to all federal agencies, all federal agencies, even urban housing, housing and urban development. And they were directed to Keep in mind uh, impacts on habitat, 
nutritional resources, pesticide exposure pathogens. Um, Xerxes says that it's still alive in Washington. Um, Xerxes just worked with the Forest uh, Service to come up with best management practices for pollinators and their land stewardship. Um, and that was, uh, Xerxes considers that a, um, a result of this directive. A, the rusty patched bumblebee was listed as an endangered species. That doesn't seem like good news, um, but it is good news because it means attention is being paid finally. The rusty patch was um, common in New Hampshire, um, somewhat common in New Hampshire, not exceedingly common, but it was uh, easy to find in New Hampshire up uh, until fairly recently, and they've not been seen since 1993. Xerxes, Soci Xerxes Society and others nominated the monarch butterfly for endangered species listing. Recent ruling came out um, they were hoping for something better than uh, warranted, but um, that's better than nothing. Um, and uh, it will be revisited in a couple of years. So obviously I'm trying to get you to fall in love with bumblebees. Um, here's the rusty patched. There's an amazing 19 minute video on the rusty patched bumblebee and one man search. Um, it's easy to find online. It's great for all ages. This man became, he's a wildlife photographer, became beguiled by the concept of, of a species um, being snuffed out. And uh, so he set out to, uh, and he did find some. And he learned why good reasons why for the decline. So it covers a lot of ground, but it's just, it's so appealing. Something else very appealing, Matt Wiley, you may remember hearing about this a couple years back. Melissa Stevenson is a beekeeper in, in uh, here in Peterborough. She raised funds to bring Matt Wiley to Peterborough to paint one of his murals. Matt Wiley was beguiled by a honeybee that flew into his apartment, his uh, urban, and rolled over dead on his floor. And that woke Matt Wiley up. Who knows why but or how, but it happened. And he set off on such an ambitious project to paint 50,000 honeybees on murals worldwide to bring a tent, well, nationwide anyway, but I, I think he's gone beyond uh, farther, uh, to bring attention to the plight of the honeybee. So I'm all about the plight of native bees. So I chatted with Matt and I gave him some articles about native bees and said that really, to tell the full picture, he needed a rusty patch bumblebee. And I gave him this photo and he wouldn't say anything. One time he said, just patience. So I tried. Melissa sent me this photo. Matt Wiley painting a rusty patched bumblebee. Not only that, but he gave it a prominent position um, on a dandelion, which is wonderful. Dandelions are great pollen providers early season. So what shall we do? Um, Robert Gagier gave a presentation, New Hampshire Audubon sponsored as part of their annual, their year long focus on pollinators. And these words just struck me here on this black um, border, this black, um, why are native pollination systems in trouble? Not native pollinators. And it, might not seem like a big deal. I just thought it's such a big deal. Just such uh, light bulbs went on. I just really, really, really embraced that concept. And so he said I could use his slides and uh, mostly I wanna use this slide because he mentions neonicotinoids. 
and it's a sp special class of um, pesticides. And so here on the right is the definition and they're called neonics. They're systemic. It's a systemic neurotoxin banned in some countries, Canada, some European countries and some US towns um, have banned it on, on town schoolyards. It's a standard lawn treatment for grubs and it's tied directly to bee die-offs. So if you hire True Green to come annually to do something to your lawns, they have to post a notice for 48 hours. One of these notices was at a local hospital that has a very big campus and there was this, looked like a lawnmower um, moving along and there was um, an array of nozzles uh, close to the ground and it was obviously spraying something. If you spread toxins, you have to post and circle what was applied. All of these um, have circled imidacloprid. It's a main neonic. Um, what systemic means, I think you know, um, well, neonics are applied as a seed coating. Um, they're sprayed on the ground um, and they can be sprayed on a plant. And systemic means that they enter this plant system from root to stem to flower to pollen. And I've talked to landowners some, and they have absolutely no idea that um, what's being spread, uh, mostly grub control, uh, mostly uh, Jap probably Japanese beetles. They have no idea what's um, that it's a toxin that's been banned and uh, traced to bee die-off. So I, <laughs> I don't want to be the only one talking to landowners. <clears throat> Uh, Rob Gagir, uh, what to do, landscaping to support native diversity. Here's a great slide. How should I change things? Add high impact native plants first, um, obviously. So what is a high impact native plant? And he, uh, Carolina Rose, Virginia Rose, they're both natives. And they're on any, uh, mo they're on most lists. There's lots of lists of plants for pollinator gardens, but um, I'm not sure they're ranked as high impact. So here's here's a good one, two good ones. And he's saying it's more than bees. Um, Moss lay their eggs on native plants. Um, the little inchworms, uh, birds eat them, lots of birds. Um, if they're not eaten, they develop into moths. Uh, Eastern whippoorwill species only eat moths and so the headlight um headlights i mentioned and that's who i'm thinking about is our it's an endangered species whippoorwills um older people remember whippoorwill whippoorwill that kept them awake at night and that you just don't hear them anymore um, so moths are declining and then the rose hips feed any number of birds um, here's another one of his slides um, which I don't totally understand, um, so I'm going to be quick here. But mostly, it um, it highlights yellow wild indigo uh, plant as a pollinator plant, and the Harris Center we have it in the Harris Center uh, um, pollinator garden, and it's um, evidently a good top one. So landscaping to support native diversity well beyond the bees. Um, this is another hugely important distinction. It's communicated in a way that will pain most of us. So here you go. What's going on here? Big green arrow suggests that hummingbirds prefer hummingbird feeders and prefer invasive European honeysuckle. European honeysuckle is a prominent place on New Hampshire's endangered, uh, sorry, invasive species, not endangered, invasive species. It, um, it runs rampant out competing native shrubs. In its country, it, homeland, it doesn't do that because there's browsers and 
diseases and um, that keep it in various uh, various forces, natural forces that keep it in check. So it, it's a participating member of the community and its uh, homeland, native land. Uh, humans are introduced species, and we have we love our our hummingbird feeders, but we're interfering with pollination systems. On the left, uh, there's a skinny arrow going down. So pollination systems are declining and introduced um, interrupters are increasing. The bottom um, plant is a, a spotted touch me not, also called jewel weed. It's a major um, food for uh, bears before they hibernate. Um, they love jewelweed. They'll feed. It grows in big patches. So I've given talk. Save the pollinators with an exclamation point. Um, and what Rob Gagir, his presentation brought home, save pollination systems. Doug Tallamy, another hero. I'm a Doug Tallamy groupie. Um, the Importance of Native Plants, his Bringing Nature Home book is, I think, um, quite popular. It's been around for a while. He and his University of Delaware students have done quite a lot of cataloging. And what they found is that black cherry, there's a black cherry tree there. You can tell black cherry because its bark looks like burnt potato chips supports 456 species of native moths and butterflies. And that's probably through nectar pollen, nectar mostly. Um, they lay um, their eggs on cherry trees and the larvae eat uh, the cherry leaves. Somehow um, they can overwhelm, uh, they, they can, uh, they can uh, uh, they're able to tolerate the I uh, can't remember what the toxin is that cherries uh, uh, emit. Um, oaks emit tannins that a lot of insects can't uh, tolerate. But over time, co-evolution, they learn to tolerate. Oaks support more than cherries, 534. But I love these photos. And I, oaks aren't as interesting as black cherries. Logical question. Invasive species, how much do they support? I'm surprised that Ptolemy's crew found anything on burning bush euonymus. It was one of the first three plants banned uh, uh, or put on the invasive species list in New Hampshire, which means you can't sell it, buy it, propagate it, transport it. So these are all leftovers from before the invasive species list. No shared history, no coevolution. Another popular um, shrub comes to mind, Forsythia, and Forsythia um, supports one. That's what they found. Um, Forsythia is not invasive; it doesn't take over. Um, it spreads, but it's not. Uh, uh, all the seeds from burning bush euonymus build up in the soil, and suddenly the understory is filled with burning bush. Someone, not Ptolemy's crew, um, counted how many uh, inchworms, it, uh, caterpillars, uh, it takes to raise one chickadee clutch. They are the perfect nutritious food, soft, filled with uh, nutrients, 6,000. So Ptolemy says, if we want to feed the birds, um, support nature. Here's a slide I took from his presentation. And the big bird feeder here is probably an oak tree. Next bigger is probably black cherry. Birch, um, birch trees score well. Um, willow trees score really well. And then there's probably some native dogwoods and viburnums and maybe some perennials uh, around the foundation. This is from Doug Tallamy's presentation uh, to Maine Audubon. It's the video that totally blew me away and made me understand the importance of native plants. I didn't get it. I knew invasives were awful, but what about all the other introduced plants? So now I know. 
Um, you can search it. I so recommend it. I'm a very slow, painful reader. I have bringing nature home here at home. Um, have I read the whole thing? No, but I've watched an hour and 20 minutes of his talk and just got, got it. His, I'll be quick here. Tallamy, Doug Tallamy the Great, his most recent book, A New Approach to Conservation That Starts in Your Yard. Reduce, if everybody reduced their lawn in half, what would result is what he calls a homegrown national park larger than all U.S. national parks combined. It's a little gimmicky. Um, if we reduce our lawn, we also save water, fewer lawn chemicals, fertilized pesticide runoff, less fossil fuel use, mowing, leaf blowing. To maintain a lawn goes against uh, nature's drive for biodiversity. So it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of energy. Remove trees, shrubs on a state's official list of invasive plants. I'm all over that. I did this uh, brochure with the Peterborough Conservation Commission highlights 12 most invasive species from the state list, most common in our region. I sadly had to add an insert, black swallowwort. I hate it. Um, it's a remote um, relative to milkweed. And if there's not real milkweed around, monarch butterflies lay their eggs on it and the larvae die. Monoculture, that's garlic mustard or biodiversity. So we're wrapping up here, pollinator food for all seasons, spring, Juneberry, Amelanchia, great pollen, foam flower, there's pussy willow. Look at all the pollen on the pussy willow. Summer on the left, swamp milkweed, pink, it's a wonderful pollinator plant. It doesn't spread like common field milkweed. New Jersey tea is my new favorite. It's the white one down there in the corner, shrub, native northern bush honeysuckle is my also a tie for new favorite the shrub so that's our landscaping um they're loaded with pollinators fall there's the honeybee on goldenrod calamy um calamy's quote about goldenrod is one of nature's greatest gifts to wildlife um asters up top there and I probably shouldn't have had this milkweed photo in the right-hand corner because it's it's more summer, um, but there it is. Resources, Jaffrey, home of Amos Fortune Forum, is well launched on a pollinator garden initiative, um, Conservation Commission, Carolyn Garretson, chair, great source for um, plant lists, and uh, they paid for signs uh, that are coming up around town uh, in yards that where um, pollinator landscaping or gardening is going on. They'll pay for plants on uh, public land, their pollinator garden at the library, and I think there was a project at a cemetery, and also road uh, along some roads. Um, the DOT is involved. Uh, there's gonna be roundabouts in Jaffray and I think they're scoping that out as a great pollinator landscaping option. Um, Jaffray's also home to Aaron Abbott's Katsura Landscaping. He's been involved in putting in some gardens. He's passionate about native plants and is launched with a partner on a business uh, raising from seed um, uh, native plants with pollinators in mind. No one will ever top Lincoln, Massachusetts for its pollinary, pollinator. Um, uh, so many volunteers, uh, local land trust is the, um, the spark. I love this quote, it's a good one to end on. Wild pollinators are a keystone species, meaning other species in the ecosystem depend on their existence for survival. What happens or doesn't happen at the pollination scale has repercussions all the way up the food chain. By focusing on plants that have co-evolved with pollinators, we expect to see dramatic improvements to the populations of these threatened species. So they have um, volunteer days, kits, that their, their website, uh, just do Lincoln Pollination Action Plan, you'll learn a lot. Resources, Native Plant Trust, uh, their website, um, 
They used to be the New England Wildflower Society. They changed their name to Native Plant Trust, which I did not understand, and now I do. Um, such an educational mecca, their website. They have handouts, classes. They also sell native plants. Um, please check Doug Tallamy's talks on YouTube. Rob Gagir is a little bit harder to find. Um, native perennials, many mail order. There's a list there, including the Native Plant Trusts, um, extensive greenhouse uh, in Waitley, Massachusetts, um, Prairie Moon Nursery. Well, you can read these. Um, uh, shrubs and Perennials, Millican Nurseries, wholesale only. Um, if you work with Aaron, um, he can get wholesale. Um, if you look for, oh, I forgot to do this one. This is the last slide from Rob Gagir, a little bit sobering. He's adamant about avoiding native cultivars, which is not easy. So a cultivar, here's the straight species on the left with its Latin name, simple, two words, binomial. And then a hybrid cultivar that's been messed with probably to make it, oh, I don't know, redder or bigger blossoms or less likely to flop over, but it's been tinkered with. And then it adds, um, you can, it's not, it, they add some things on the end of the name so you can tell. And so he did a, a, um, a nectar count um, uh, between the two. And if, if you tinker with, um, if you make a plant blossom bigger or more fragrant, um, the plant only has so much energy and something, um, there's a trade-off and often it's nectar pollen. Um, the Native Plant Trust magazine uh, available online has a lead article, cultivars versus um, straight species that Mother Nature made, co-evolved. Um, I'm showing my bias. It's hard to find straight species. Join, support the Xerxes, Xerxes Society. Such impressive lobbyists, education, books, plant lists, presentations. I'm going to do a little departure here under resources, and this is a personal uh, resource that I created. Um, as Bob said in the introduction, I've been at it for a long time, writing field trips. I've learned a lot, and I wanted to leave something behind. So I call it my legacy project. It's a daily nature almanac. Um, pollinators, there's a lot in it, um, a lot from this talk, but so much more. And it's nature out the window, down the trail, along the roadside, local parks, it's, it's, it's local. Uh, the goal was a Nature 101 education, one day at a time, to hand on insights into how the natural world works. It's amazing fostering what Rachel Carson called a sense of wonder as best I could. Through familiarity comes connections. That's my hope. Uh, the Harris Center, the wonderful Harris Center in Hancock is the publisher. It's at the Toadstool Bookshops and Steels in Peterborough and by mail through me. Um, its biggest fan and supporter uh, is someone I met on a uh, Harris Center birding field trip a long time ago. We've been pals. He's an arborist. And uh, he sent me an email that still makes me smile. The genius of this almanac, filling the educational void we all have but didn't know about, remedied by our daily reading. I love the way he said that. It's a gap. I mean, he's an arborist. He loves birds. Um, so he's finding things in the calendar in the almanac that he didn't know about. It's not a calendar. You can start on any day. You can start tomorrow, August 7th, and uh, reach December 31st and just flip the page. So back to resources. I'll leave this up for a bit. Um, you also, uh, the uh, forum, Amos Fortune Forum, this will be available on their Facebook page to revisit. Um, I'll add my email. I am available to talk with anyone. You can come see what we're doing here. Uh, actually, we're just starting out, so it doesn't look so great. 
Um, I'm very grateful to the Amos Fortune Forum for giving me this forum for something I care so much about. So thank you very much. Well, and we're very grateful to you too for all of your insights that you have generously shared with us tonight. And <clears throat> as is the tradition of the forum, uh, we have a half gallon of local maple syrup for you, which I uh, understand is in the background there. You've already received it. And so I hope you put it to good use this weekend. Um, it's we a had jug <laughs> We had a number of questions, uh, Francie, but uh, in the interest of time, we've run a little bit over. Uh, I do think that uh, you answered most of them. A lot of them came in around, you know, how can we help and what are the resources? And so those last couple of slides that you put up um, hopefully have addressed most of the questions. For the other ones, um, I, I will try and get those to Francie and, and see how we might be able to answer them offline. Um, but with that, um, I want to thank Francie once again. It was a very interesting and, and um, um, packed uh, presentation, lots of good information there. And I want to thank all of the audience um, as well. We look forward to seeing you next week uh, when our speaker will be Ted Widmer, whose presentation is titled Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington. I also have one last quick request. If you haven't done so already and are so moved, consider making a donation to the Amos Fortune Forum. You can do that on our website or by mailing a check to us. We so appreciate everyone's support. So we hope to see you next week. Thank you and have a good rest of your evening.